Coming in at number 10, we have Woody Broke Sid. Anyone who has seen the original Toy Story movie will remember Sid. He was the deranged kid next door who probably needed some tender love and attention from his parents but never got it, so he turned to dismembering toys and rearranging them into monstrosities for his own pleasure. In his defense, he never knew he was tampering with something that was alive. When Woody finds all of the toy monsters in Sid's house, he eventually gets them to team up and confront Sid in something that probably broke his psyche and left him medicated up to the gills. We don't know what happened to Sid after this encounter with the living toys, but I can't imagine he was comfortable walking into Al's toy barn. Being around action figures would probably give him a panic attack, and on top of this, no one would ever believe him unless someone else saw the same thing. I'm sure if this experience happened to Sid, then there would have to be at least one other person in the Toy Story universe who had seen these toys come to life. Now you have an underground movement of conspiracy theory weirdos who are trying to convince the world that toys are alive. And the craziest thing is is that they would be right. So even though Sid was a messed up kid, Woody made sure that he stayed messed up for the rest of his life. Coming in at number nine, we have Woody never wanted to be rescued. In Toy Story 2, we have Al from Al's Toy Barn kidnap Woody and take him to a private collection. This leads to him finding out that he's actually much more famous than he ever would have believed. This is a very Finding Sugar Man scenario. After this is revealed, Woody kind of falls in love. He gets a horse who becomes one of his best companions and he makes you ask the question, was he happier there? Maybe there was a little piece of Woody who would have liked to stay a collectible. I mean, he would have had to abandon a lot of his friends and taken up a whole new life. But remember, this movie started with Woody having his arm torn and being put on the shelf and forgotten. When he gets kidnapped by Al, he gets his arm fixed and then introduced to a bunch of people who are willing to treat him like a king. There might have been a part of Woody who wanted to say goodbye to his old life where he was literally treated like trash and hello to a new beginning where he would be royalty. Coming in at number eight, we have Leader of the Spies. Here's something very strange about Toy Story. If we cut back to the original movie and freeze frame on the scene when it's Andy's birthday, we might find something a little weird. When you have a bunch of kids running around at the bottom of the stairs, you will find that all of Andy's friends are the exact same kid. They are all copies of Andy. Now, why did this happen? Well, it's definitely to speed up the production of the movie. Making character models is taxing and takes a good chunk of time. It wouldn't make sense to have a bunch of unique models on screen when you're going to see them for a fraction of a second. But fans have run with this and made claims that these are in fact real clones of Andy, meaning that Andy and his family live on an experimental military base where clone families live and interact with each other like normal people. Where do Woody and the rest of the living toys work into this? Well, they are all spies. They are robotic infiltrators implanted with artificial intelligence that have one purpose, to spy on all the clones so the government can see what's going on when they think no one is watching. And Woody is the leader of all these spies. Buzz would be second in command. Coming in at number seven, we have Woody is a nihilist. What is a nihilist? Well, it's a belief system that basically says nothing matters. Nihilists believe that there is no God, there is no afterlife, there is no meaning to anything we do. It's basically like being an atheist, but with more frowning. Now, in the original Toy Story movie, the relationship with Buzz and Woody is one where Woody is trying to convince Buzz that he is just a toy, that his interstellar quest is not real, and that the only reality is to be played with. With. It seems like Woody, although he has a cheery disposition, has come to terms with the fact that life could have nothing at the other end. Coming in at number six, we have Woody is immortal. The toys in Toy Story are indeed alive, we can all agree with that, but most of them are just huge chunks of plastic, and plastic doesn't break down that easy. Just ask the massive trash island that's floating in the ocean. Last time I checked, it was the size of Texas, and we're all going to die. Now if they are indeed alive, and their bodies might never break down because plastic takes forever to decompose, as time moves on, we we will only come up with better ways to take care of toys. So there's a good chance that Woody could live forever. Coming in at number five, we have Woody is the reincarnation of someone incredible. Where does the consciousness for these toys come from? I don't think toy spirituality will ever be answered within the Toy Story movies because that's a pretty heavy concept for a kid's movie, but good thing I'm not a writer at Pixar because that's exactly what we're going to get into. Perhaps certain people are chosen to come back as toys. Say it would be people who worked with kids or who are made maybe social workers, people who knew how to properly take care of children and look out for them. So if there is a god in the Toy Story universe, he picks only the purest of heart to come back and take care of these kids. It seems that there are very few evil toys in the Toy Story universe, and they might have become corrupted after being transformed into toys. Maybe Woody is the soul of Buddha, who came back to make sure all the toys live in harmony. And that kind of rolls into my next point. Coming in at number four, we have Woody is a guardian angel. Every time Andy, or 
or any of the other toys are in trouble, Woody will put his own life at risk to save them. Remember when Wheezy gets thrown into the garage sale and Woody finds a way to save him with a broken arm? So maybe that is his purpose and where his soul comes from. Woody literally is an angel. He was sent down to Earth to take the body of a toy and make sure that Andy grew up to be the amazing person he was meant to be. I mean, there are very few movie characters who have as pure a heart as Woody. Maybe he's getting directions from the big man upstairs himself. Coming at number three, we have Woody is in the Illuminati. When we go back to the movie Toy Story 3, there are a lot of people who have pulled out some Illuminati imagery from certain scenes. For instance, when Woody and the gang are rescued by the alien toys using the claw, this isn't just a reference to one of the most classic jokes from the Toy Story universe, it's also pointing towards the Illuminati mythology that believes all members of the Illuminati will be rescued by aliens when our current civilization comes to an end. There's also Mrs. Potato Head walking around with one eye for most of the movie, and we all know that the Illuminati has an eye at the top of the pyramid as their main symbol. All of this imagery could be from the Illuminati using their dark magic to make sure that one of their most important members is always safe. I mean, if you were running a secret demonic club, wouldn't you want a talking toy to be one of your members? It would make your club way cooler than all the other clubs. Coming in at number two, we have Woody is the leader of a toy army. Woody seems to be the leader of the toys wherever he goes. Every now and again, a toy will try to challenge his leadership, but by the end of the movie, they will either be working with him or disposed of. It happened with Buzz, it happened with the Prospector, and so many others. Woody might convince all these toys to work for him and might be the leader of the largest toy army by taking out as much of the competition as he can. Even going back to the Illuminati point, the Green Alien come in to save Woody, so that means he has allies outside of the toys you traditionally see on screen. Also, if you are the leader of an army that no one knows about, I think that's a surefire way to get yourself inducted into the Illuminati. Coming in at number one, we have Woody came from Andy's dad. Where did Woody come from? He's quite a dated toy. Throughout Toy Story 2, we learn about the Woody's Roundup origin. Woody's Roundup was a black and white TV show, meaning that Woody would have most likely come from the 1950s. So how did Andy get one of his favorite toys? When I was a kid, I wasn't rushing to the toy store to get the hottest gift from 50 years ago. Some people say that Woody was passed down to Andy after his dad passed away. This is why Andy cherishes the toy so much. This theory is backed up from the scene in Toy Story 2 where Andy's mom calls Woody a family possession. Starting us off at number 10 is that Wheezy is actually evil. Remember that cute little squishy penguin toy named Wheezy from Toy Story 2? Well, there's a theory out there that he is actually the bad guy of the movie and not Al from Al's Toy Bar. Wheezy was one of Andy's favorite toys once upon a time, but eventually was forgotten about and left on a shelf to get covered in dust and lose his squeaker. While Woody and Buzz's rivalry first started in the first movie because Andy forgot about Woody while he was playing with Buzz. That made Woody get jealous. Obviously Woody ended up overcoming that jealousy, but maybe Wheezy didn't. Maybe his jealousy actually fueled a plan to make Woody be at the yard sale and get snatched up by some toy collector, with Wheezy making it back in the house himself and no longer having Woody for competition. This theory really hurts me because I remember feeling so sorry for Wheezy when I watched Toy Story 2 for the first time. I still remember seeing it in theaters and he was so lovable and he was just so hurt that you just you just fell for him. But now I'm gonna need to watch Toy Story 2 again. Coming in at number nine is Toy Story Illuminati. That's right, there are many people online all around the world that say Toy Story 3 is one huge reference to the famous conspiracy group known as the Illuminati. How does this make sense? Well, many believe that Lotso, the film's antagonist, brainwashed Buzz Lightyear by resetting Buzz from play to demo mode. One of the other big pieces of evidence that supports this theory is a line of dialogue that is spoken by the Ken doll. He says, he made us into a pyramid and put himself on top. It's a bit of a weird line to have in a scene and many connected back to the Illuminati symbol of the triangle with the eye in the center of it. So does Toy Story 3 allude to the Illuminati? You tell me down in the comments because I don't think I can watch this one again after that heartbreaking ending. If you haven't seen it yet, be careful. That one hit way too hard the first time around and I don't think I'm even, I'm not ready to relive it yet. Coming in at number eight is Woody and Mr. Andy. Now who is Mr. Andy? Well, I'm referring to Andy's missing father in the films. Many believe that since Woody is an old toy from an old TV show in the 50s known as Woody's Roundup, that maybe this toy was given to Andy by his father and maybe his father has since passed away. Meaning that Woody is not just a fun toy but also a sentimental and special possession of Andy's father. Uh, man oh man, did that one get like really sad just really really quick. But you know what, 
I got beef with this theory because in the movies you can see Andy with bed sheets and tons of posters and stuff in his room that have Woody plastered all over them. Would a TV show from the 50s still be making all of that merchandise in the mid 90s? I don't really think so. Or is it his father's? Maybe? I, I don't know but I mean I can't see him giving Andy literally everything that has Woody on it and letting him still use it because I mean that's going to be some valuable stuff. And that stuff has got to be rare and lastly would they have made character bed sheets back in the 50s that look as as good as the, what they do in the film. Uh, I don't know. I'm not really sold on this one, but let me know what you think. Coming in at number seven is Jesse and Mrs. Andy. Now, who is Mrs. Andy? Well, this time I'm referring to Andy's mom. There is a theory out there that cowgirl Jesse is actually Andy's mom's old toy. Where's the proof? Well, we all know that Jesse's former owner name was Emily, and Andy's mom's name is never specified in any of the films. But in one of the flashbacks through the films, Emily can be seen wearing a Jesse cowgirl hat, just like the hat that Andy is seen wearing in the movies, as it looks a lot more like Jesse's hat than it does Woody's. So does that make the Toy Story 3 ending even sadder? With not just Andy saying goodbye to his childhood playmates, but also Andy's mom saying a final goodbye to her toy in that special time in her life? My god. What am I doing to myself here? Coming in at number six, we have Woody equals Lotso. That's right, without Andy, many think Woody could have ended just up as antagonistic and evil as Lotso. No, not Woody. Easy, easy, let me explain. Lotso, the big pink stuffed bear, handled his leadership at Sunnyside Daycare much like a dictator. He sucked. Lotso was accidentally abandoned in his owner's old home, and when he finally got to see her again, he found out that she had a new favorite toy and that he had already been forgotten. His little pink stuffed heart was then shattered and led him to being the bad guy in Toy Story 3. Now, if Woody didn't have Andy for his owner, many believe that Woody could have become just like Lotso. Woody's story in the first movie begins with his jealousy towards Buzz, but Woody changes his mindset because he didn't want to lose Andy the way that Lotso lost his owner. So, Woody could have been just as evil as of a character as Lotso in another rendition of the story, but he didn't. Or maybe the story hasn't ended. Coming in at our halfway point is poor Sid. There's a theory out there that Sid wasn't actually a bad kid at all. Maybe he was just a product of a poor home life. One reason is that back in the 90s, it wasn't as easy to just buy whatever you wanted online. So some think that the possibly life-threatening rocket toy that is meant for much older kids was mailed to him after his parents ordered it and didn't care that he was too young or nor that he was left alone with this dangerous rocket. There's also a scene in the movie that shows Sid's dad passed out in front of the TV with cola cans strewn all over the floor. But maybe those cola cans were actually wobbly pops and not just normal pops if you catch my drift. So maybe Sid began experimenting and building and taking apart toys and acting out because this was just a desperate call for attention and love that he never got from his parents. Who knows? And to be honest, I don't think there I think there are extremely rare cases of bad kids. Something always sparks bad behavior, but hey, I never met Sid personally, so you be the judge, maybe he is a bad guy. Coming in at number 4, we have Sid is a guard garbage man and this is where I'm going to say that he's not a bad guy now because in a scene in Toy Story 3 we can see a garbage man pick up a load of garbage all the while he is rocking out to some awesome tunes. But if you look closely you will see that this garbage man is wearing the same t-shirt that Sid wore as a kid. But this guy seems happy and in good spirits so how is this Sid? Well many people think that Sid changed his ways after learning that toys could talk and the reason he became a garbage man was that so he could save all of the forgotten toys out there so they don't get incinerated at the city dump or he can even fix them by making some weird mishmash toy combos like the baby head with spider leg or the uh, fishing pole with the with the legs you know maybe he just wanted to give some love to some toys that weren't necessarily going to get it anymore so Sid is a garbage man for now because this next theory actually gets much much darker starting us off in our top three at number three we have that Sid is actually dead whoa 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 okay that escalated quickly I mean one minute he's a garbage guy next minute he's no longer with us. If you watched Pixar's 2017 movie Coco, there is a scene with the skeleton on stage that has the exact same t-shirt as Sid from Toy Story. Toy Story 3 came out in 2010, so that means Sid worked as a garbage man until his untimely death that led him to be a rocker in the afterlife, in Coco. Maybe, I mean Coco does take place in Mexico and Toy Story is definitely not set in Mexico, so maybe it's just a small easter egg, but if Sid is indeed the rocker skeleton, then what happened? Coming in at number 2 we have Immortality, the exact opposite of our 
our number 3 spot. Many people believe that the toys in the Pixar universe are actually immortal. Since these toys are not actually organic living beings, many believe that these toys could in fact live forever and that the only way to meet their demise is if they are melted down. Which when you think about it, actually makes that scene in the first Toy Story with Sid burning Woody through the forehead even scarier. That's one way Woody would actually meet his demise. So. Yikes. The other proof is that Woody, Jesse, and Bullseye are all toys from the 50s and they just keep being passed on to new owners and never really seem to age. Especially with Rex's cameo in Wally. -E. Maybe this means that he is actually aware that humans are gone and now it's just robots. Ugh, yikes. No, for that reason alone, I would never want to be immortal. And finally, coming in at our number one spot is one of the darkest theories out there. It's that Toy Story 3 is actually an allegory to the horrific and disgusting events of World War too. One possible piece of evidence that supports this theory is that when Buzz suggests that the toys hide out in the attic to avoid being donated is a reference to Anne Frank and the events that she talks about in her diary. How they hid away from all the evil people. They also believe that the toys that were sent off to Sunnyside Daycare was also an analogy to people being sent away to the disgustingly horrific camps run by the followers of this is about as dark as they come here folks and I for one can see the similarities but I don't know if this is intentional. I think the events of World War are just so sad and horrific that they are so well known that many things can be alluded to being inspired by them. Or maybe many many stories and events are secretly inspired by them and are self conscious without us even fully realizing it. Either way this one is crazy dark and probably ruined your childhood just a bit so I'm sorry. Starting things off and at number 10 Nemo doesn't actually exist. I hate to be the one that burst your bubble but as it turns out Nemo might have been just a figment of Marlin's imagination. In Latin the word Nemo literally translates to to nobody. Do you guys think that maybe the writers are trying to add a dark element to this movie? Because if we're taking that into consideration, finding Nemo means finding nobody. How sad is that the Reddit user takes things one step further because it is the internet? Do you guys remember the scene where Marlin's wife and children die? Yeah, I try to block that out myself, but let's just say that all of his family actually are murdered by the Barracuda. That means Marlin had a hard time coping with his loss, so he imagined that he had a child named Nemo to help him, you know, with his depression. How bleak is this? Marlin's wife left him and this sad theory brings us to number 9. Forget everything you thought you knew about Finding Nemo because, well, this theory is about to shatter everything. Reddit user Black Hat Samurai one believes that Finding Nemo starts off a lot differently than what we are led to believe. Apparently, everyone survived the Barracuda attack, but while Marlin was passed out, his wife realized that he forced them to move to a dangerous neighborhood and that Marlin is actually a terrible father, so the wife packed up all her fish things, took the kids and left Marlin without saying goodbye. But she left her only child that was disabled because she felt like she wouldn't be able to take care of him. I mean, wow, is this real life? right now? What the heck? I think Marlin's wife is the one that's evil and a very terrible mother. I mean, who does that? Number 8, Marlin is taking advantage of Dory. Throughout the majority of the movie, Marlin and Dory are on a crazy adventure, you know, to find his son Nemo, right? Well, according to this theory, Marlin used to know Dory when they were younger. He always had a crush on her, but he was too scared to approach her. Over the years, Marlin became so obsessed with her and he wanted her all to himself, so he came up with a plan to capture her. But this plan backfired and he actually caused the accident that led to her amnesia. Once she was able to roam around the ocean again, Marlin made his move and introduced himself to her. And now he basically uses her for whatever he wants and the sad part about it is that Dory has no idea what's truly going on. The five stages of grief takes us on to number seven. As it turns out, Finding Nemo doesn't have a happy ending at all. All of Marlin's family died in the beginning of the film. So in reality, well, Finding Nemo is about Marlin's struggle throughout the five stages of grief. First we have denial. Marlin Marlin has been suffering from denial ever since the Barracuda attack and he refuses to believe that his son actually died in the attack. Next we have anger. This is pretty clear where we see Marlin have a ton of outbursts with Nemo. And do you guys remember when we see Nemo at the drop off? This is the first time that Marlin realizes that Nemo has disappeared and he might actually not be alive. Bargaining comes next. This takes the majority of the movie when Marlin is desperately searching for his son and he'll do anything to bring him back. Then we have depression. 
depression, and this is pretty apparent when Marlin saw Nemo's dead body. Yes, I know Nemo was only faking his death, but Marlin didn't know that. Then we have acceptance. When Marlin is captured by a fishing net, Marlin accepts that the only way he'll be with his son again is if he dies himself. I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty sure that I'll never be able to watch this movie ever again. It's just not the same after, you know, hearing about this. Number six, what really happened to the fish from P. Sherman's fish tank? The tank gang were the fish from the dentist's office. You know, the fish that helped Nemo make it back to the ocean. But the last time we see them, they're floating in baggies at the end of the movie. I'm pretty sure that whenever we buy a fish from the pet store, they tell us that you should keep the fish in a bag and place it on top of your aquarium water for about 15 minutes and then release them into your tank just so the water levels, the temperature can get as close as possible. And according to Google, fish can survive in a plastic bag for about seven days. Days. I'm pretty sure the tank gang had no way of escaping from those plastic bags. Oh, and during the Finding Dory post credit scenes, we see that the tank gang is still in the same plastic bag as the original movie, and they traveled all the way to California. Wouldn't they just run out of oxygen, and wouldn't they be starving? Oh, and their water, it has to be full of waste as well. There's no way it's that clear. So I think that the tank gang wouldn't be able to survive in real life, and I think that they actually died from either, you know, suffocation or starvation, Either way, it wasn't pretty. Next up, number five, we have petting zoos. This next theory is actually pretty disturbing. Apparently in the Finding Nemo universe, there are a ton of theme parks where they force mentally and physically impaired sea creatures behind cages where other fish can feed them and watch them swim around like some sort of sick and twisted petting zoo. Do you guys remember in the post opening credit scenes, Marlin and Nemo, well, when they were swimming to school and Nemo said that he hopes his dad doesn't freak out? Like, he did at the petting zoo? Why the heck would fish need a theme park with a petting zoo? This is kind of equivalent to having a petting zoo full of humans. I mean, that's immoral and wrong. The real synopsis takes us to number four. How would you attempt to describe the plot of Finding Nemo? I probably say something like this. Finding Nemo is about a father who will stop at nothing to rescue his son from the dangers of the open water. But what if I told you guys that the real synopsis is, is something more like this? It's a movie about a serial killer who kills a little boy's mom and all of his other siblings. And the attack left a little clownfish with a disability and in a sudden turn of events, the boy gets kidnapped and the dad goes on an adventure to find and save his lost son with the help of a mentally disabled woman. So you're telling me Finding Nemo is about serial killers and kidnapping. I mean, that's it. I'm officially done here. How do we get past this dark theory and how do we watch Nemo again after learning about all this? Well, next up, number three, we have Bruce is the son of the shark from Jaws. Yeah, that's right. Our favorite favorite vegetarian shark, Bruce, might be the son of the shark from Jaws. Apparently in the set of Jaws, there were a bunch of shark models that were used for filming. All of them were named Bruce. In Finding Nemo, Bruce never knew his father, and it's actually pretty common for great whites to leave their infant children behind since they can swim at birth. Also, Bruce is a part of a support group that goes against being mindless killing machines. Maybe his mother told him who his father was and he vouched to never be like him. Or maybe his father left his family because he wanted to terrorize and eat humans. You know what? I'm just glad that Bruce isn't anything like his father or else Finding Nemo would be an entirely different animation. I'm not sure if Pixar would be behind that one. Dory's memory loss is caused from a traumatic incident she had when she was young and this theory brings us to number two. I mean, have you guys ever wondered what happened to her? Well, throughout the entire film, we obviously know that Dory is struggling with some form of amnesia or short-term memory loss, but we don't really know what happened to her. All we know is that Dory wasn't born with this condition. So what could have caused her to suffer from her debilitating memory loss? Maybe Ellen DeGeneres just forgot her lines and that's what happened. Well, one theory suggests that she was physically abused by her parents every day. She grew up in a really bad household where her parents didn't love her and they took out all their frustrations on her. So Dory could be struggling with, you know, a combination of 
repressed childhood memories and a physical impairment on her brain that is causing her to lose her short-term memory. Let me know if you guys have other theories about that one in the comment section below. How did Dory lose her memory? Number one, Marlon only wanted to find Nemo so that they can reproduce. Okay, now I can officially say that I'm scarred for life. At first we thought this is a story about a father and son relationship, but things took a turn for the worse with this theory. In a clownfish colony, a male and female are in control. So in Finding Nemo, Marlin is a dominant male and Coral, his wife, is a dominant female. But when a dominant female of the colony is removed, the dominant male will change into the dominant female. Yeah, you, you heard that right. A little confusing, but that's how it goes down. Clownfish are all born as a male, but they possess both female and male reproductive organs. So in the beginning of the movie, Coral and Nemo's other siblings all died, so that means that Marlin would have to change into the dominant female, and the next fish in line would be the next dominant male, that being Nemo. So essentially, Marlin is searching for his son Nemo so that they can reproduce and build a new clownfish colony. That just sounds so wrong on so many different levels, and I wish I didn't research that. Mm -hmm.